I'm going to share a message today that is uh, relevant to our church and what we're going through right now. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but let me tell you, because as pastor, people ask for prayer and they tell me things. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that since we have merged churches, the devil has really been fighting people in the church. Sickness, financial problems, marriage difficulties. I could go on and on and on. <clears throat> and we know why. Uh, because the devil's a loser, right? <laughs> and uh, so I want to share with you a message that I entitle three big mistakes that Christians make when they're under attack. Now, that's a big, long title for a sermon, isn't it? <clears throat> But I want you to get this today because this is extremely important in understanding in your life when the enemy comes after you. And you can tell when the enemy is coming after you, things are worse than normal. Like there's always challenges in life, but there are times in our lives when you can just, you feel like somebody is beating up on you in a way. And when you go through times like this, and let me tell you, you will go through times like that. When you go through times like that, there are some things that your flesh wants to do, but you can't let your flesh do what it wants to do. Amen? Amen. I'm going to start in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, did you know you have an adversary? Amen. You know, don't think you're going to hide under the radar. And like, he just don't know who you are. He is your, he hates you. He's your adversary. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being, being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, I like that. You know what that means? It means that it ain't going to last. Come on. <laughs> After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever and ever and ever. Oh, you mean, I could just go on for, I could go through this. Let, let's just... Let's just start with, you know you have a, an adversary, and you're supposed to be on the alert and know about him. Did you know that he is seeking someone to devour, which means he can't just devour anybody he wants to. There are certain people he has to pick out to devour, right? I'm going to get to that in a little bit. And, and that if you suffer, you're not suffering alone. There are other brethren who have suffered the same things you have suffered and gone through what you have gone through. And it's only going to last a little while because the God of all grace is going to do what? He's going to perfect you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. He's going to make you better because you went through the fight, right? And then the last line, to him be dominion forever. What does that mean? That means the devil doesn't have dominion over our lives, over our situation, over our bodies, over our finances. To him be dominion over our lives forever and ever. There are a lot of people in this church right now who are going through challenges. The enemy is mad at you. He's mad about what God is doing in your life and in our church. Listen, this is not unusual, for we are not ignorant of the devil's schemes. We don't go, what's going on? I don't understand. We know it's the enemy, right? The devil is going around trying to find someone to attack. He wants to derail what God is doing in your life. Now listen, he can't go after God, so he goes after you, right? Come on. And let me tell you a little secret. He really doesn't have any power over you either. In fact, the only power that the devil has over you is what you give him. And today I want to share with you three mistakes that Christians make when they're under attack that give the devil power in their lives. These three things will make a temporary trial turn into a permanent defeat. I want you to notice some things today. Some things that Satan does to, to, to us. There are things we do to ourselves ultimately because we give him the power 
to do them to us. And the first one I want to talk about is when you're under attack, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to isolate yourself. Have you ever noticed like when a, a, an animal gets older or wounded and it feels like it's going to die, it'll run off somewhere and hide to die. And I think maybe that's an instinct that they don't want to be eaten by a predator or something like that. I don't really know. Uh, but sometimes even as Christians, when we are under attack and we start to feel heavy, we the flesh wants to isolate. The flesh wants to stay home, wants to not talk to anybody, wants to not be around anybody. And let me tell you something. You ever watch those videos where the lion is chasing the herd of gazelles? And you know how the lion eats the gazelles? It gets one to veer away from the herd. Let me tell you something, church. The devil wants to get you away from the herd for the same reason the lion wants to get the gazelle away from the herd. So he can devour you. Are you catching me today? He can't devour you if you're in the herd, right? He can't devour you until you get alone. And then when you get alone, he can get into your thoughts and get into your life and start chewing on you. Don't isolate yourself from the Savior. There are some people who, whenever they go through difficult times, they run from God. And listen, it's really about how you view God. If you view God as someone who, when you make a mistake, he's going to be mad at you and scold you, you would, uh, it would be in your nature to run and hide from the mean father who was going to scold you and punish you. If that's your view of God, some run from God because they get mad at him because, uh, you know, he lets something happen to them. How could you let this happen to me? You know, I'm always reminded we go through difficult times here in our lives, but I always try to put my life in comparison with the disciples' lives, right, who were uh, closer to God than me, right? Paul went to the third heaven in a vision, right? And, and Peter talked to Jesus face to face, right? All of these things, right, they were in the thick of it. They had faith that they were willing to die for, and yet of them, uh, they were beaten. They were uh, uh, put in prison. They were shackled. Uh, they were put to death for the sake of Christ. Listen, I've never been shipwrecked for Jesus. I've never been stranded on an island for Jesus. I've never been put in prison yet for Jesus. I haven't been beaten for Jesus. And, and the torment that I go through is nothing compared to what others go through. So this idea that bad things aren't supposed to happen to me is kind of silly, right? Amen. Come on. People get mad at God because he lets something happen. And ultimately, people run from God because they don't really believe he's God. In other words, they don't believe he can do what he says he can do, or they don't believe that he will do what he says he will do. They feel like their situation is bigger than God, and so they stop praying, and they stop reading the word, and they stop praising God, and they stop worshiping God. And because, like we talked about last week, they're not feeling it anymore, and they don't have the feelings, they get mad at God, and they run away from God. But listen, when you're under attack, the last thing that you should do is run away from God. There are some people who run to God when they're wounded, they see God not as the one who's going to scold them for falling down. They see God as the one who's going to pick them up when they fall down. Hallelujah. They run to their father and they say, Lord, I've messed up and I need you to pick me up. Help me, Lord God. They see God as a help in time of need. That when difficulties come, they know their father doesn't have a lecture, but he's got a helping hand in for them today. Hallelujah. They know that God is God and that his word is true and they trust him. That if God said it, I don't care what the banker says. I don't care what the weather report is. I don't care what the politicians do in Washington. I don't care what the doctor says. What I believe is the word of the Lord. He is my God and I trust him. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, come to me when you got it all together. He didn't say, come to me when you fixed every problem. He didn't say, come to me when you feel good about it. He said, come to me when you're so heavily burdened, you can't take it anymore. Come to me with your problems. Come to me with your challenges, and I will give you rest. Don't run from the Savior. And listen, don't isolate yourself from the saints either. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another 
and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The entire New Testament is made up of instructions of how we are to love each other, encourage each other, bear burdens of one another, share with one another. Amen. How can you be a part of that if you isolate yourself? Now, listen, the flesh tells you when you're going through a challenge that you have every right to lay in bed and just get some rest and not get out into the world and not get out into the church. But that is the last thing that you need to do. I don't mean to brag, but we make you better when you're around us. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. We lift you up. We encourage you. And sometimes when you need a word of encouragement, we speak it to you. Sometimes when you're complaining and whining too much, we say, hey, you know what? You're complaining and whining too much. Hallelujah. We need each other. Why is it that people isolate themselves from the saints of God? Well, for, for one reason, people get really embarrassed when they're going through something difficult. Some are afraid of judgment because, you know, when you're going through something, uh, other Christians might look at you and look down on you, and you're afraid they're going to think poorly of you. Sometimes you don't want to look weak. You don't want to tell people you're sick because you're afraid they'll think you're weak. Or maybe you just lo you're one of those Lone Ranger types that you just want to face it all by yourself. You just want to face it alone. I want to encourage you today and let you know you were not meant to do the Christian life alone. Come on. You say, well, I got Jesus. Well, I know you got Jesus, but a part of the way that Jesus planned for you to live your Christian life is arm in arm with other people. Because the spirit in me sometimes uh, is stronger in a sense, and, and I can lift you up, and I can encourage you, and I can help carry you when you're weak. In fact, that's how God uses us to help one another. God didn't give you uh, your Christian life so that you could lone ranger it. He gave it to you so that you could be a part and share with one another. This past Monday morning, I woke up extremely sick. I was violently sick. And, uh, man, I was just moaning and screaming and whining and praying and, and just take me home, Jesus. This is enough. I've had enough. <laughs> you know, that kind of sick. And so I asked for prayer on Facebook. And uh, every time I do, for me or Kathy, 100 people or more always pray for us. And I think to myself sometimes, it's a shame that some of y'all are so proud you won't ask for help. Because let me tell you something, there is multiplied power in multiple people. Let me say that again. You need to hear it. There is multiplied power in multiple people. Don't isolate yourself. Now, I'm not saying you got to say everything that's going on in your life, but you need the saints of God. I'm reminded of Peter. Who you remember Jesus had been taken and was being accused and about to be crucified and Peter was warming himself by the fire and they questioned him that day. Uh, you were with this Jesus, weren't you? And he denied Jesus three times. You know why? Because number one, P Peter had separated himself from Jesus. And he'd separated himself from everyone else. And listen, when you're all by yourself and the devourer is around you, he feels like he's got you right where he wants you. Your flesh is going to tell you during these times that you need to just be alone and get with your thoughts and all of that stuff. But listen, that's the lie of the devil. Don't isolate yourself. Get near to God. Get near to God's people. Get out into the world and rely on others around you and they will help you through this time. Some of you today, you may feel like you should have just stayed home and been by yourself, but I'm glad you came to the house of God because around us, we're going to help you today. Number two, when you're under attack, here's a mistake that people make. They live in the lie of the devil. Once again, did you notice that this original scripture we read says that Satan is seeking someone to devour? He's seeking someone because he can't just devour anyone and everyone. He's got to find a particular person. He's got to find someone who will believe his lies. Come on. He's trying to get you to agree with him. You see, Satan spins tales of death and destruction because he's trying to get you to react. I remember watching a, a video once again of the 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 impalas out there in the African wilderness and they go up to the edge of the water slowly and they begin to uh, get a little drink of water and we know what's lurking under the water don't we 
There's a crocodile under there, and the crocodile is hungry, and he's smart, and he's sneaking up, and you can't see him, and the little gazelle or whatever it is is just drinking very softly, trying to be real still, and in this particular video, the crocodile came up, and the gazelle got so freaked out, it jumped straight in the air and right into the crocodile's mouth to its demise. Can I tell you something? Sometimes that's what we do. The devil just says, boo, and we jump up and we do all kinds of crazy dumb things and we find ourselves right in the mouth of the enemy. And if we would have just stood our ground and trusted in God. Did you notice what their original scripture says? It says, uh, strengthened, be of sober spirit, on the alert. Uh, the devil goes about as a roaring lion. Resist him, firm in your faith. These are uh, descriptions of how we must uh, conduct ourselves during this time. Staying firm in our faith. We don't isolate ourselves, and we don't believe the lie of the devil. Because here's what happens. The devil really doesn't have power over your life. But what he can do is when something happens in your life, is he whispers whispers a little lie and he gets you to believe it. He gets you to freak out. He gets you to start reacting to it. And ultimately what happens is not that the devil destroys you, but you destroy yourself by making bad choices. Come on. Making stupid choices because you believed the lie of the devil. You quit your job. You'll leave your marriage. You'll, you'll spend money you don't have. You'll, you'll get mad at the pastor. You'll get mad at somebody else. You say, well, they're looking at me funny. And the devil's lying to you saying that's because they're gossiping about you and they hate you and they really want bad things to happen. All of a sudden, you've got this imaginary enemy in your life. And, and you begin to attack back and talk about them. And you have believed the lie of the devil. And now you're making choices and decisions that mess everything up. So listen, don't live in the lie of the devil. Don't entertain the lies of the enemy. Don't let them go on. When the devil lies to you and says, yeah, it's worse than the doctor says, you're not going to live. Just say, nope. Devil, I reject that. I'm not believing that. I'm not entertaining that. Some people not only entertain it, but they add to it. They begin to plan their funeral. They begin to plan their bankruptcy. They begin to plan their divorce. They begin to plan their unemployment. Come on. It's like some people enjoy the misery so much they make it up in their own mind. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that if two agree as touching any one thing, it shall be established. Now, God has said some things, right? They don't apply to your life unless you agree with it. Now, the devil has said some things too. They don't apply to your life unless you agree with it. So let me ask you today, are you going to believe the truth of God's word? And agree with it? Or are you going to believe the devil and what he's lying to you and telling you in your mind and in your heart? Because whatever you agree with is what you're going to get stuck with. Come on. Amen. Amen. There are a lot of people today who are living in a bad situation because they agreed with the lie of the devil rather than the word of God. Don't entertain the lies. Don't believe with them. Don't speak the lies. Don't say, oh, it's so bad and it's going to be terrible and I can't believe this happened. Listen, don't say it out loud. You don't have to say that. Only speak the word of God and don't make decisions based upon those lies. Come on, are you hearing me today? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now watch this. For we are destroying speculations. You know what that is? That's the lie of the devil. That's the what if this happens to you. Oh, it's going to be bad. You're going to be in the hospital. You're going to suffer. You're going to have all that. You're financially, you're destroyed. And, and your husband's going to leave you. And your wife don't love you anymore. Whatever it is, the speculation that goes in your mind. What is he saying here? We are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing that raised itself up against the knowledge of God. You know what that means? Whatever comes into my mind that doesn't agree with the word of God, I'm going to cast it down. I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to get it out of my mind. I'm going to say, delete. I reject that. Come on. I reject it. It doesn't belong in my mind. It doesn't belong coming out of my mouth. I'm only going to stink the word. I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to believe the word of God. We're going to take every thought captive until it is obedient to Jesus Christ. 
You know how to stop worrying? Take those thoughts captive. Take those feelings captive and say, you know what? I'm going to hold on to you. I'm going to prevent you from growing. I'm going to squeeze you until ultimately you fall in line with Christ Jesus who said this about my life. What has he said? He said, you shall live and not die. Hallelujah. He says, I'm the Lord God who healeth you. He said, I have given you victory over all the power of the enemy. He said, I will provide for you according to my riches and glory. What did God say about your life? Come on. Hallelujah. Don't believe the lie of the devil. Listen, when you get into a fight with the enemy, it can get easy to get caught up in negative thoughts, negative emotions, and lies, even to the point where you're living the lie. You know, I like to think of when God says things that, that are the truth, right? It's like if you, have you ever had one of those pieces of cloth, maybe it's a pillow or something, where it has a direction to it, right? And as long as you push it in a direction, it looks very smooth and it's very pleasing to you. And, and when somebody, like if my wife has something like that and she puts it in the right direction, I like to come and just smear a little streak in the other direction just to irritate her. How many of your husbands know what I mean? Come on now. Just to, just to ear it. You know what a lie is? A lie is the, tr the truth is smooth and it goes in a straight direction. A lie is just like, it's just going the other way, right? And listen, you can live in the direction of the lie if you want to. You can live in the direction of you're going to die. It's all bad. Sickness, problems, all this difficulty. It's, nothing's good. You can live in that if you choose to. Or you can live in the truth. And, and sometimes being a Christian is just continually taking that structure, that fabric of our faith. And, and the devil, he keeps pushing all of these irritating little lies. And we just keep straightening it out with the word of God. We just keep smoothing it right back, back down. You can... You can put a lie in my mind, Satan. I'm not going to believe it. I'm going to reject it. I'm going to stay with the truth. Are you hearing me today? Yes. The word is our weapon today. The word of God is what we use to fight the enemy. It's what we use to fight the lies. And listen, prayer is our weapon too. But you know what prayer really does? I'm going to tell you when prayer gets powerful. Prayer, prayer gets really powerful when we line up our thoughts with the word of God. When we've been in God's presence, we've talked to him so much that we get in line with God's word. Do you notice when Jesus uh, taught his disciples how to pray in the Lord's prayer, he said this, he said, our father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know he began everything with this thought, Lord, let your will be done. The way it is in heaven let it be done in my life. Let it be done in my family. Let it be done in my finances. And then he proceeds to pray about, you know, provide for our needs, lead us not into temptation, all of these things. Whatever need you have, it always begins with, Lord, the way it is in heaven, let it be your will in my finances. Let it be your will in my life. Let it be your will. And how do we know the will of God? Because of the word of God. Amen. So when you pray to a point where you stop telling God what you want and you start saying, God, whatever you want in this situation is good with me. You have begun to line your will up with the word of God. And that's where it gets powerful, my friend. So if you're in a fight with the enemy, don't isolate yourself. Don't dwell or live in the lies of the devil. And finally today, don't forget. Don't forget who you are and don't forget who's you are come on you are a child of the living God you belong to him he said certain things about you there are things that belong to you simply because God is your father amen hallelujah oh that's the beautiful thing about salvation you know when the prodigal son came home he told his father, I'll just be a servant and I'll work for you. I'll earn a paycheck and I'll earn my right to eat your food and live in the servant's quarters. I'll wear the servant's stuff and I'll do the servant's things. But you know what? The father said, no, you're my son. And so just because you're my son, even though you didn't earn it, even though you've done some things that maybe uh, you shouldn't get it, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a party for you. I'm going to kill the fatted calf. I'm going to put a robe on you and a ring on your finger. I'm going to bless you because you're my son. Can I tell you something? I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care how much you've messed up. I don't care the degree of sin that you've committed. Let me tell you, if you're a child of God, there's some things that are yours simply because you're his child today. Come on, he's given you authority, he's given you blessing, he's given you protection, he's given you provision. The Father is going to care for you because you're his child. Hallelujah. 
And let's not forget what he's already done. Come on. He's already won the victory. He's already, you say, well, why am I in a battle? Well, because the victory was won in the spirit realm where it really matters. And for it to get manifested in your life, you've got to agree with it. You've got to have faith in it. You've got to trust in it to the point where it finally becomes manifested in your physical life. Are you hearing me today? Watch this, Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He's forgiven us all our transgressions. Having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. <laughs> the devil had accusations, and can I tell you, you were guilty. You, you did it. You were guilty, and he had accusations. He walked into the courtroom with a big old thick file of stuff he was going to tell the judge about. Only problem is Jesus took care of it. He was hostile to us, but Jesus has taken that out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Hallelujah. Every accusation against you, every mistake you ever made, every time you remember your past, God has forgotten your past because Jesus nailed it to the cross. Well, I want you to get this. Are you ready? You know how I know that the devil has no power over you? Because it says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authority. Bless the name of the Lord. The devil has no power over me because at the cross, Jesus took every weapon that the enemy had against me away from him. Hallelujah. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Glory be to the name of the Lord. Can you just praise him today? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to his name. How do I know that the enemy's lies are empty? Because God took the power away from the devil. How do I know that I'm victorious through Christ Jesus, my Lord? Because God nailed every decree against me to the cross. He triumphed over them. The empty tomb means that death has been defeated in my life. Hallelujah. And I am free forevermore. Romans 8, 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Watch this. Will tribulation... Distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, just as it is written. Oh, it's about to sound like a bummer here. For your sake, we are being put to death all day long. It's like we're sheep being led to the slaughter. But even in the midst of all these over things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him that loved us. Can I tell you something, child of God? The greater the battle, the greater the victory, because it's already been won. You're not fighting for victory today. You're fighting from a place where victory has already been won. You're standing on a hill called Calvary where the blood has been shed. The devil has been defeated. You have been declared victorious as a child of the living God. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So I'm going to take every battle I have and I'm going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. I'm not going to isolate myself. I'm going to run to my father. I'm going to run to the church. I'm going to run to prayer. I'm going to run to the word. When the devil lies to me, I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm going to tell him you're a liar. I'm not thinking that. I'm not speaking that. I'm not walking in that. I'm going to believe what the word says. When I forget what the word says, I'm going to open the word and I'm going to find out what it says. Amen because I'm going to trust in the truth of God's word and cast down every lie of the devil. And I will not forget that I am a child of God. I didn't earn the victory. Somebody earned it for me, but I live in it today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.